Hi, and welcome. My name is Victor Gijsbers, and I teach philosophy at Leiden University in the Netherlands. In this video, I want to look at the ethics of quotation, right? These sort of ethical rules for quoting people in your books and articles. And I want to do that by looking at a very specific example. The use of one little sentence or phrase from a book by Sandra Harding uh, in texts written by Richard Dawkins, the British biologist, and Susan Haag, the British philosopher. So when we quote people in our own texts, we usually do that in order to sort of have them speak in their own words in our text. So in a sense, we are giving voice to other people. Maybe people we agree with because we, you know, want them on our side, or maybe people we disagree with, maybe even the people we specifically oppose because we sort of want to have a kind of discussion, right? We want to make clear that we are really addressing the kind of points that our opponent, the person we are reacting to, is making. So when we quote people, we generally do that in order to make clear what this other people said in order to be as fair to them as possible. But of course it is possible to quote people in ways that do not have that, you know, rather ethically attractive goal of being fair to the other person. There are ways to quote people that have the precisely opposite effect. Now, the most obvious form of that would be to misquote someone, right? To attribute words to them that they never said. That is pretty crude, right? And pretty easy to detect. But something that is much less crude, and in many ways I would say much more problematic, is quoting people out of context. Is quoting people in such a way that it seems that they are saying something that is not what they're saying. And especially if they seem to be saying something that is so weird, so bizarre, that it sort of lessens the probability that whoever is reading our text is gonna search out that quotation. Now that's a little bit abstract, and I'm going to illustrate that through the, uh, the phrase or, or, or the words um, that I encountered yesterday in Susan's, Susan Haag's description of what Sandra Harding was saying. But I want to start not with Haag, but with uh, what I think is a, a much more famous book by a much more famous author, uh, the book Unweaving the Rainbow, by Richard Dawkins. And Dawkins, of course, is one of the big names in, in popular science, one of the big names in people talking about biology, science, religion, uh, the relation between science and religion, even between science and philosophy. Well, here is what Richard Dawkins says in Unweaving the Rainbow, when he is discussing what he thinks are some extreme feminist ways of thinking about science. He writes, the most ridiculous example of feminist bad science may be Sandra Harding's description of Newton's Principia as a rape manual. Okay, I'll, I'll read that again. The most ridiculous example of feminist bad science may be Sandra Harding's description of Newton's Principia as a rape manual. And Newton's Principia is, of course, the big book by Newton in which he sets out his uh, theory of motion, right, from which we get laws like F is M times A. So if one reads this, this Richard Dawkins quote, and there's no more context, right, he doesn't go into exactly what this means, uh, exactly what she says. It seems pretty extreme, right? It really does seem a ridiculous example of, well, I don't know whether it would be a ridiculous example of bad science or a ridiculous example of bad talk about science, but anyway, it looks pretty ridiculous. I mean, Newton's Principia is a book full of mathematical formulas about how to calculate the motion of the earth and there's some some general stuff about scientific method and God and, 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 and things like that. Um, but it's not about rape or sex or violence or anything like that. So it seems completely ridiculous to take this book and claim that it is a rape manual. So ridiculous, in fact, that one might immediately 
classify Sandra Harding in one's mind as a crazy person whom it wouldn't pay to read. Okay, but that is Richard Dawkins, right? And Richard Dawkins is, I guess, well known as as a very polemical figure. I mean, you wouldn't go to Richard Dawkins if you wanted to have careful exegesis of what somebody said and meant. What about Susan Haag? Right? Haag is, uh, I would say, a very good philosopher um, who has written about topics like logic. Uh, so she, she, one of her books is Philosophies of Logic, very interesting book, very good introduction into the philosophy of logic. Um, she, uh, in this case, writes a book, Defending Science Within Reason, between scientism and cynicism. Uh, and in fact, she has written some very worthwhile articles on scientism. I mean, Susan Haag really is a good philosopher. And so one would expect her to maybe be a little bit careful in how she quotes other philosophers. Well, one thing that Haag does that Dawkins doesn't is she gives us an actual full quotation of uh, most of a sentence of Harding. Here is what Haag writes. And this appears in a list of uh, descriptions of people whom she sees as cynics, people who are cynical about science, who don't want to accept science because they think it's bad. All right, here's what Haag writes. Sandra Harding asks why it isn't as illuminating and honest to refer to Newton's laws as Newton's rape manual as it is to call them Newton's mechanics. So let's read that again. Sandra Harding asks why it isn't, and now we get the quotation from Sandra Harding, why it isn't, as illuminating and honest to refer to Newton's laws as Newton's rape manual, as it is to call them Newton's mechanics. Now, this is not a misquotation, right? This, is, this phrase appears exactly like that in Sandra Harding's text. But there's no further context given. If we have no further context, what do we think that Harding means? Right? What could she possibly mean when she suggests that it might be just as illuminating and just as honest to refer to Newton's laws as Newton's rape manual as it is to call them Newton's mechanics? Well, really, the only thing that would come up for me would be the thought that Harding apparently thinks that laws like F is M times A, you can see them as, you know, scientific rules for making predictions, right? You can call them Newton's mechanics if you want to, but they are also, and in the same sense, and just as strongly tools for sexual violence, tools for the subjugation of women, tools for, I don't know. Well, that seems rather weird, right? It seems rather weird it seems even, you know, still ridiculous to claim that learning about F is M times A is just as successful in allowing you to predict the movement of small objects rolling across a table, just as successful in allowing you to do that as it is in allowing you to perpetrate acts of sexual violence because it doesn't seem to be any use for anyone who would have the rather um, evil wish to perpetrate acts of sexual violence, right? It doesn't seem to have anything to do with that. So again, I mean, even though Haag gives us a little bit more of Harding's words than, than Dawkins, the overall impression is the same. The overall impression is that Harding must be making a claim that is completely ridiculous, that is so out there, that she can't be taken seriously as a conversation partner. That if you're a serious scholar or scientist or philosopher, you don't even need to react to Harding. I mean, this point is so out there. Mm. All right. So that is the impression that we get from reading Dawkins and Haag. Now what I want to do, of course, is I want to look at the actual context of this phrase in Sandra Harding's um, first book, the Science Question in Feminism, published in 1986. And so I'm going to read out a passage of which this is the last phrase. Here is the entire passage. One phenomenon feminist historians have focused on is the rape and torture metaphors 
in the writings of Sir Francis Bacon and others, e.g. Machiavelli, enthusiastic about the new scientific method. Right, so feminist historians have focused on a particular type of metaphor that we find in Bacon and Machiavelli and other people who are inventing this new scientific method, um, metaphors about rape and torture. Traditional historians and philosophers have said that these metaphors are irrelevant to the real meanings and reference of scientific concepts held by those who use them and by the public for whom they wrote. So traditional historians and philosophers have claimed that, okay, yes, you know, people like Bacon and Machiavelli have this disconcerting tendency to talk about nature as a woman who has to be forced to give up her secrets and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that's irrelevant. Right? It's not cognitively significant. It's just flowery language. Okay, we go on. But when it comes to regarding nature as a machine, they have quite a different analysis. Here, we are told, the metaphor provides the interpretations of Newton's mathematical laws. It directs inquirers to fruitful ways to apply his theory and suggests the appropriate methods of inquiry and the kind of metaphysics the new theory supports. So there's another set of, of metaphors that these writers use. They talk about nature as not just as a woman who has to be, you know, sort of mastered and forced and all that kind of stuff. They also talk about nature as a machine. And traditional historians have thought about these two metaphors as being very different, right? The, uh, uh, the, the sexist, like violent metaphors are supposed to be cognitively insignificant they don't tell us anything about the theory, about how it is to be applied, about the kind of metaphysics that we have to adopt. But the machine metaphor is cognitive, cognitively significant. That did have an effect on how people uh, developed science, how they did science, on the kind of metaphysics they, they ended up adopting. So two sets of metaphors, but very different roles. One of them is cognitively insignificant. The other is cognitively significant. Okay, again, let's read on. But if we are to believe that mechanistic metaphors were a fundamental component of the explanations of the new science, uh, sorry, of the explanations the new science provided, why should we believe that the gender metaphors were not? Right here is the methodological question. How do you make this distinction? Right? How do you find out that one set of metaphors is cognitively significant and another set of metaphors is cognitively insignificant? What is the methodology for making that decision. A consistent analysis, Harding goes on to say, a consistent analysis would lead to the conclusion that understanding nature as a woman indifferent to or even welcoming rape was equally fundamental to the interpretations of these new conceptions of nature and inquiry. Presumably these metaphors too had fruitful, pragmatic, methodological and metaphysical consequences for science. In that case, why is it not as illuminating and honest to refer to Newton's laws as Newton's rape manual as it is to call them Newton's mechanics? So, again, what Harding is doing in this passage is this. She says, we find in these writers two sets of metaphors used very extensively. One set of metaphors that have to do with nature being a machine and one set of metaphors that have to do with nature being a woman who has to be mastered and forced and who wants to be mastered and forced. The traditional historian has told us one set is cognitively significant and one set is cognitively insignificant. But why, right? How do we know that? What is the methodological proof, right? How, how, where's the methodological rule that allows us to make this distinction. And then Harding suggests, if, if we don't have a good methodological reason for making that distinction, right, if there's no good reason to do that, um, then if you want to be consistent, you would have to take these two sets of metaphors as being on the same footing, right? You would have to give them the same role in your history of science. And that would mean that if you take the machine metaphor seriously, that is, if you want to call Newton's laws Newton's mechanics, right? And mechanics is machine, right? That's basically the same word. 
if we call them Newton's mechanics, we are taking the machine metaphor seriously. So if we want to call them Newton's mechanics, taking that metaphor seriously, why wouldn't it be just as illuminating to take the other metaphor seriously and call them Newton's rape manual? Okay, well, there's a lot of things we can think about that. Um, one of the things we can think about that is that maybe there is a methodological distinction to be made, right? Maybe you can show that the machine metaphors were cognitively, cognitively significant and the subjugation of women metaphors were not cognitively significant, right? Maybe you can show that. Um, and then you would have a good reason to, you know, adopt the term Newton's mechanics and not adopt the term Newton's rate manual. Okay, so maybe that's possible. Maybe it turns out to be not possible, but that's, you know, this is a, a serious methodological question and something that you would have to actually know, um, not just something, but probably quite a bit about 17th and 18th century science, um, well, especially 17th century science in this case, uh, about, you would have to know quite a lot about 17th century science in order to say something sensible about this, right? About the different roles that these different metaphors might have. Now, I don't think that Harding tells us a lot about, you know, why, why you would make one methodological reach one methodological conclusion or another, right? I mean, she seems to move pretty quickly towards the claim that the default position is that there is no difference. But if we're having that discussion, if we're wondering whether Harding makes a point too quickly, if we're wondering what kind of argument one could give to show that set of metaphors A is more cognitively significant than set of metaphors B, then we're, we're talking. Right? We might be disagreeing or we might not be disagreeing, but there's a serious issue here. There's a serious question here about methodology in the history of science. Um, and it's a question that one might want to have answered. It's not insane. It's not ridiculous. Right? And what is being said here is especially not what Dawkins, for instance, tells us that Harding is saying. So let me read Dawkins again. The most ridiculous example of feminist banned science may be Sandra Harding's description of Newton's Principia as a rape manual. Right? The, by not bringing in the term Newton's mechanics, which is the opposition that Harding is making, right, between one set of metaphors and another set of metaphors, Dawkins shows that he has literally no idea what the passage is in which this, this phrase occurs. Um, and in fact, if you look at Dawkins' own citations, it turns out that he just copied this phrase from another book uh, by other people interested in, in arguing against uh, these feminist conceptions of science. So he probably, I mean, all the evidence suggests that he never looked up what Sandra Harding was actually saying, that he never looked up this passage, but did feel that it was totally all right to say that what she wrote was the most ridiculous example of feminist bad science. That, I would say, is a ridiculous example of bad quote, quoting, right? If you, if you go as far as to totally make fun of someone and say that they are ridiculous, and it turns out that you just took three words from somebody else's description of their writings and you never looked up what they actually said, that is a really bad quotation practice. Um, but I don't think that Haag's practice here is, is much better, right? Because although she actually, you know, gives us slightly more context, she doesn't give us enough context to even start guessing what Harding might be talking about, right? The mere phrase that it's as illuminating and honest to refer to Newton's laws as Newton's rate manual as it is to call them Newton's mechanics doesn't allow us even in a hundred years, I would say, to guess that what Harding is doing is discussing the different roles assigned by historians to two groups of metaphors. Right? I mean, how are we to get that? And that is the whole point, right? That is the whole point of Harding's passage. A totally different point is suggested, the point that physical theories are actually tools for sexual violence against women, right? But that's not Harding's point. At least it's definitely not the point she's making here, right? So 
I think that what's going on here is, well, it's a certain kind of, of sloppiness maybe, um, or carelessness, or quickly wanting to make a point and not caring so much about being fair to, to your opponent. And I suppose that that happens a lot. But I think this particular example of it is extra bad precisely because it makes the original author look like someone who's crazy, right? I have no complaint against someone who quotes Sandra Harding, explains what she means, and then disagrees with her. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if you can make a pretty strong case that the machine metaphors were more important than the subjugation of women metaphors. I'm not sure, I'm not sure, but especially when it comes to sort of the metaphysics, you know, I can, I can think of some ways to develop that argument. So if you want to criticize the point that Harding is making, that's okay. But if you present it in such a way that it seems that she's making a totally different point, a pretty ridiculous point, so ridiculous that your readers probably aren't even going to look up Sandra Harding and might not even, you know, grab any Sandra Harding reading ever again because they have mentally classified her as a hack, um, then you're really doing someone a disservice and you're really doing the exact opposite of what quotation ethically is meant to, um, to do, right? It's meant to give voice to the other person. But here you are actually sort of making the other person say something that they didn't say, even though they use those words, in such a way that other people will become far less likely to ever listen to them again, or to approach their work if they ever do meet it in anything like a serious mindset. Right? If you read the Dawkins and you see a Sandra Harding book, you might think, oh, oh that's that. <laughs> oh, let's check out whether there's some crazy stuff in it, right? I mean, that is not the right way to approach any book, of course, um, but it's the kind of mindset that you're setting. So I guess that the end result of, of this talk is just to affirm something that is really obvious, but maybe that's true for every ethical conclusion, right? If it wasn't obvious, then why would you believe it? Um, don't do this kind of thing, right? Don't try to make somebody look ridiculous by quoting them out of context. And if you do make someone look ridiculous, you know, very few well-published, well-read authors are ridiculous, right? So make sure that you go back to the original text, check it out and see whether they actually said and whether it actually meant what you think it meant. Uh, I could do another video about, about people quoting uh, out of context Derrida's claim that there's nothing outside of the text and, and putting the most ridiculous metaphysical interpretations on that. And maybe I'll do that at some point. Um, but I mean, this is a widespread phenomenon and it's really harmful for philosophy, for scholarship, um, for, for debate and discussion. Thanks for listening.